Good morning, church. Good morning. Praise the Lord. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. The title of what we're going to be studying today, this is not a sermon. It's like a Bible study, so prepare to study. It's together in Christ. Together in Christ. And I really want everybody to be engaged. Everybody. Even the little ones. So if you're a little one and you've not received this, uh, maybe you should raise up your hands so that the deacons can help you. Because I want all these little ones to pay attention to the screen. And every time they see one another, they need to start making some maths. And at the end of the day, they will count how many one another we have studied today. And I want them to tell me how many one another we have studied. Let me say it again, please. Don't count how many times I say it. Count how many times you see it on the screen, okay? And please remember to put your name. When we come together next Sabbath, there will be a lot of gifts for the kids. For those, for those who participated, as well as those who probably get the right answer, okay? So if you are a kid and you don't have one, you can raise up your hand so they the kids can get you one, okay? Again, this is a Bible study, so it's not a sermon. And just as a reminder, a few weeks ago, we had a study together. And the study was about the three most important Christian virtues. And I hope you still remember. We studied about faith, we studied about hope, and we studied about love. And we concluded that the greatest of all is what? Love. love. So today, we're going to talk more about Christian love. And I want to thank all those who have been leading us uh, out in worship service today. Thank you, our special singer. He reminded us again that we have to hide in the shadow of Christ. It's not about us. It's about Christ. We cannot be Christians by our own standard. Christians are people that have submitted to Christ. It has to be Christ's standard. It's no longer my standard. It's no longer your standard. It's the standard of Christ. Thank you for that song. And thank you for the children's story, talking about the unity that we need in church because we are members of just one body. And so if you notice everything we've been doing in worship service today has been about one another. It's about one another in Christ. So together in Christ, and I hope you're ready to study. Once again, if you're a little kid and you don't have this, make sure you ask our deacon to give you one before we come to me. Right now, I'm going to ask you to please pray with me as we begin this study. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for what you are going to do for us today. Our desire is to study at your feet so that we may learn what it means to be together in you. We want to live a life that is truly reflecting that we are Christians. Help us to be who we often pretend to be so that all the glory and honor may be unto your holy name. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Together in Christ. And I also want to encourage the... Uh, Adults, uh, if after the study you really want to have the slides, please feel free to ask me. I will send it to you. If you want the uh, sermon notes or the Bible study notes, tell me. I will email it to you. Because we are living in a culture that is teaching us to be self-dependent. That's what the culture is telling us. The culture is telling us to look inward. Look at yourself. You are great. You can do it. The culture is telling us to be self-focused. The culture is telling us to be individualistic. The culture is telling us you don't need anyone else. In fact, you can do it all by yourself. Erroneously, we try to say this so that we can build up the ego of our children and make them great. But let's remember, as Christians, we are not all by ourselves. Christ says, I'm the head. And you are all part of me. So we belong to one body. 
And today we're going to study and see how the love of God is manifested when we all walk together. And when we all walk together, we can see that God himself is the master of the team. Now, let's start with this. We're going to start with the word of Jesus. It says in John 13, 34, a new command I give you. Love one another. Kids, that's your first clue. That's your number one. So start counting. As I have loved you, so you must do what? Love one another. And when I read this, the first thing that came to mind is that this is not a suggestion. Does it sound like a suggestion? Does it sound like a, you know, I'm going to give you a good advice. No. Jesus is saying it's what? It's a command. So if you're a Christian, you have to take a command from the leader of the team. He's saying, I'm commanding you to do what? To love. Oh, that sounds strange. Jesus is not pleading with us. Jesus is not begging you to love other people. Jesus is not making a deal with you. He's saying, I command you to do what? To love. That's the first point. The second point, Jesus is not saying, you can go out and love the people the way you want. Did you see that in this text? No. Jesus is saying, I want you to love just as I have done what? Loved you. Jesus is saying the example of the love has to be the kind of love, the way of loving that I've expressed to you. So, the way Christians love is not the way they just choose. You know, I'm just going to decide that I'm going to love these people. And that's it. That's not it. Because we also see that Jesus is saying, you must. Did you see that word? Yes. Jesus is not saying, you know, I give you a new command, love one another as I have loved you, so you may, or you may choose to love one another. Jesus is saying what? You must love one another. This is serious. Because Jesus is saying, if you're going to go around and tell people that you are my disciples, then you have to take this serious. So Jesus is asking us to engage with him in this process of loving people. Actually, this is what we call evangelism. It's, you know, sometimes we miss the point. We think it's the Bible study that we give. We think it's the prayer that we pray with people that's really the core of the center of our witnessing. No, it's the love. That's the center of our witnessing. And I hope that as we continue this study, that we will learn more about this concept of one another. One another. So many one another in the Bible. In fact, if we have to study them, we need several ways to study the one another. Why is it one another? Look around. Look at the brothers and sisters that you have. And this is just in this church. In other places, there are a lot of people that belong to this group of one another. Jesus is saying, you must love one another. Kids, I hope you are still counting. So love one another, there are so many verses. And the first one that follows the one we just read is John 13, 35. We just read John 13, 34. And Jesus was explaining to the disciples, saying, this is the reason why you must love one another. He says, by this, get this, by this, how many men? Oh. All men. All men we know that you are my disciples. Wow. That is the confirmation of our discipleship. That's the confirmation. If you do what? If you have love for one another. Do you want to have a confirmation that you are a Christian? Love people. Express the love of God. Not the way you want it, but the way Christ wants you to do it. And John, we always call him John the Beloved. You're going to read a lot about John if you're taking notes. 1 John 3, 1. This is the message that you heard from the beginning. It's not like a new message. 
that we should do what? Love one another. And 1 John 3, 23, John continues, and this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to do what? To love one another as he did what? As he commanded us. John kept on going and going, and if you listen to the memory and the uh, scripture reading for today, you will see that John did a lot of talking about loving one another. In the text that we read, John went forward and said, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. You see, the problem here is that God really wants to extend his love to everybody, but not everybody gets it quickly. And so when we have a group of people that are already calling themselves Christians, God is now relying on us to be who we have been pretending to be by actually loving people so they can see God in our lives. So John went forward and said, no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So suddenly, you are a Christian, but people are watching you. People are watching you to see if there's anything different in you that can tell them about Christ, about God that you claim to belong to. And in the second book, John continues. John he loves writing about loving and loving. He said, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we have heard from the beginning, I have that we do what? Love one another. Before I began this study, somebody asked me, he said, you know, you guys always talk about loving one another, loving one another. What does it really mean? You know, there's a lot of sound on loving one another. So what we're going to do today, brothers and sisters, if you're ready, we're going to learn our ABCs. Oh, somebody said, ABCs? No, what's that? We're going to learn our ABCs, and if you're a slow learner like me, I'm not going to take you from A to Z, okay? We're going to learn from A to F today. The kids are wondering why the parents have to relearn their ABCs. Don't worry, we all learn it together. Because when it comes to the concept of loving, when I say love one another, there's a lot of meaning in that. And a lot of people are confused in what it really means to love one another. And so Bible is very clear on so many ways that we can show love to one another. And what we're going to do today is just learn six of them. Just six of them. A to F. And we can begin to learn. We can begin to practice this. And we can begin to grow together as one body in Christ. Are you ready? Okay, let's begin to learn our ABC. The very first one is accept one another. Let's say it again. Accept one another. This is the beginning of loving. You have to accept other people. Acceptance is a big deal when you want to really love. You know, if you don't accept people, just don't, don't pretend as if you one day wake up and you're going to be in love with them. It will not happen. And this is very important because Christ himself, he told us that acceptance is very, very important. Let's learn about acceptance. Romans 15, 7 says, accept one another. I hope it's accounting. Then, just as Christ accepted you. Did you hear that? Because remember, in Christ expressing his love to us, Christ did something marvelous. He accepted us. Bible tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ did what? Died for us. While you and I were lost, Christ was looking for us. That's Christ did not even mind how dirty, how sinful we were. 
he accepted us. He said, I want that one. That one is mine. This, this boy is mine. This little girl is mine. We were not even cleansed yet. He accepted us. Romans 12, 16 says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. This is one of the problems with acceptance. Pride. But be willing to do what? Associate with people of low position. And do not be conceited. Brothers and sisters, in the house of God, there's nothing like people of low position, people of high position. Because in the house of God, we are all one. Again, going back to that oneness. And that's why the first thing we have to defeat is pride. Who told me that I'm more special than you? Who told you that you are more special than other people? Where did you learn that? Because in the presence of God, we are all one. And in order for us to accept one another, we have to defeat pride. So if the Holy Spirit is pointing at your heart this afternoon, that there is pride, you need to have victory over that pride. And 1 Peter 5, 5 says, All of you, cause yourself with humility towards what? One another. Because God opposes, oh my goodness, that's a very powerful word. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to who? To the humble. Brothers and sisters, humility has to flow in the church. You know, I understand, for some of us, when we go to work, because of our positions, because of the kind of work we do, a lot of people kind of, you know, show us a lot of respect. And that's good. Respect has to be in the church too. But when it comes to the state of our hearts, to people, in the way we look at them, there has to be humility. Look at the Bible. Look at the people that God used in the Bible. They were people that normally people would say, this fisherman, who is he? And God used those people to confound even the wise people. So in the church, in order for us to grow in unity, we need to accept one another. And if we're still struggling with that, we need to pray to God to help us have victory over it. I thank God, you know, when my family, when we first came to visit this church, it was about four years ago, we were looking for a church. And so we came to visit. And we felt accepted. We didn't feel that anybody joined us in any way. There was just a, this open harm. And it's been four years. And we're still here. Amen. And we're still enjoying the fellowship. That's what I'm calling our, our, by acceptance. And this is very important church. I don't want you to start grading yourself on how good you are with acceptance. Because let me tell you, the more we do evangelism, the more we bring in more people to this church, the more we have to deal with this point of acceptance. The more we see people that we look a little bit different from how we look, or have degrees that are different, or maybe have no degrees, or maybe no education just as we did. And so we have to prepare our minds for acceptance. We cannot segregate people in this church. We cannot have cliques of people and say, you know, those people, yeah, I mean, and let me tell you, some of us, we already have cliques already. So when other people come, we have to be ready to bring them in. It's okay. I know some of us, when it's part of time, we always sit together. But remember, when other people come, we have to change how we sit. Because that's the way to show them that we are accepting one another. Are we clear on acceptance? Okay, let's go. Now, parents and kids, your parents, they've learned their hair. They're going to be. They're like B says, bear with what? One another. Bear with one another. You see, Christ, again, is our example. There's this, there's this, I don't know where the belief came from. That somehow we can be in this church and not offend one another. I don't know. I don't, uh, maybe some people live in another world. How can we be together and not offend one another? I mean, it's, how do you even imagine it? 
The problem is not the offending. The problem is in bearing with. You know, if you tell me that everything I've ever done in this church is perfect, then I'll tell you face to face. It's that you don't know me or you're telling me a lie. You know, because let, let's face it, because in bearing with one another is for us to offend one another and say, brother, you did this, and say, I forgive you. Amen. That's in the bearing. And brothers and sisters, in true love, we have to bear with one another. Amen. Let me tell you what the devil does. When there's a church where there's no bearing with one another, who? That's when you see backbiting. Do you know what she did last Sabbath? You will never be there. Oh, do you know what he did two weeks ago? Oh, I don't know what, where this one is going to lead to. It's because people cannot be with one another. In order for us to be true Christians, we will accept one another and we will be with one another. The disciples, before they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they came together and they started confessing to one another. I can imagine Peter telling John, I said, John, you are too quiet. I just can't I just can't handle you and John say, you know, Peter, you talk too much. <laughs> and I say, you know what? It's all for the love of Christ. Amen. It's all for the love of Christ. Yes. That's where we need to get to. Let, see, let's not run away from offending. Yes. People become so calculated. I don't want to offend anybody. Again, if we're gonna be one body. That means we have to move much closer than comfortable. Then we have to somehow offend one another, but we have to be ready to do what? Yeah. With one another. Bear with one another, brothers and sisters. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Amen. And forgive not as you wish, but forgive as the Lord himself forgave you. And that's why, you know, the standard is not us. The standard is Christ. So when you are struggling to forgive another brother or another sister, remember Christ. Remember what he did for you, and that will help you. Ephesians 4, 32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving. I like that word, forgiving. He puts it in a continuous sense. Because somebody will say, you know what? He has done it again. You won't believe it. He did it again. And he did it again. I'm just done. He says, forgive one another. Even as Christ continues to forgive us. Ephesians 4, 2. Be completely humble and gentle and be patient. Bearing with one another. Patience is very important. Because again, as you try to bring people together, they really, really have to bear with one another in patience. And I thank God for where we are this church. But let's remember, the message today is not just for you to look around and say, how are we doing this church? It's to prepare us that as we evangelize, as more people come to this church, as we engage, there will be need for us to bear with one another. Because before you know it, we might start having a situation of saying, where are these people coming from? What's wrong with them? Remember, we have to do what? Accept one another, bear with one another. Now we've gone through B. Are you ready for C? Okay. We have to do what? Care for one another. You know, a caring church, somebody has, this is a question we struggle with, and I just want us to tell ourselves the truth. Somebody say, why is it that, you know, you present the truth about the Sabbath to some of these people and they still say, you know what, I just can't leave my church. And you won't, you know why? It's because of the care. When you preach to people that are in a very caring church, they struggle between truth and caring. They, they kind of have this at the back of their mind that maybe someday their own church too will get to know the truth. But the caring is so powerful that's keeping them where they are. And so what we want to do for them is let them know that we are also very caring. That it's not just that we know the truth, but that we have a very caring church. And that's why in a church like this, it should not be strange that when somebody is happy, 
we're happy with the person. And when somebody is crying, we have to cry with the person. Why? Because it's part of how we show that we care. And remember, we are all one body in Christ. Just one body. And that's why if your leg is hurting, the whole part of the body is finished. Okay. Every part of the body is finished. Caring for one another. First Peter 3, it says, finally all of you live in what? Harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate. And be humble. You can see how things are coming together. First Peter 4, 9, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Without grumbling. You want me to say that again? Without grumbling. You know, hospitality is a very powerful thing. And I know many people try a lot to do hospitality. But when you do it, do it from the depth of your heart. And do it without expectation that you get your return. And that's why the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Don't let us do things like the people in the world. You know, let me tell you, the people in the world, they, they are very calculating. You know, Brian, it's your birthday. You know, I'm looking for a contract. I'm going to give you a birthday gift. You know, yeah. And I know when it's time for you to look through all those who have submitted proposal for contracts, you better remember me, okay? So I'm going to give you this gift. And my expectation is someday you will return. <coughs> Or, oh, this beautiful family, they're visiting. I'm going to ask them to come and stay in my house. Because I know if they stay in my house, <laughs> I know his position. He's a big man. When I need this, he will not let me down. That's the way the people you want me. In the church, is different. When you show hospitality, when you give, give without an expectation that the person will return it. But wait on the Lord who blesses every giver to bless you. Amen. That's the difference. So many people will come to church. They will join us. The church will begin to grow. And the people will be in need. And you are struggling between if I give or if I share, what am I going to get in return? Remember this. Loving is about caring. Zechariah 7 9 says, This is what the Lord Almighty says. Administer true justice, show mercy and compassion. Compassion is a key thing. Many of us here are so gifted. When you see somebody that's looking sad or something, you go to them and say, I hope everything is okay. Is there anything I can do to help? And even if you don't have the means, the fact that you are listening to them, a lot of people feel blessed already that you care so much. Brothers and sisters, we should not be people that rush so fast. We finish the worship service, we go in there to eat, and you can't even listen to anybody's story when they are ready to share their story with you. When was the last time? Let me ask you. When was the last time somebody told you his or her story and he said, Why don't we stop right now and just pray about it? When was the last time? We need to care. And really show that we care. So we've gone to accept, bear with, care for. And we're going to go to the next one, which is kind of very interesting in church, which is to dignify. To dignify means to honor. You know, it, it, it's to look at somebody and say, you know, you, you, are, you, are, you are special. You are just special. And the person say, uh, are you talking to me? <laughs> because they don't expect you. And I want us to learn it from Christ. I want us to learn the way Christ has dignified us. The Bible tells us that even all our righteousness, they are like what? I mean, who is proud of wearing filthy rags all around? But Christ, in his love, has decided to dignify us by giving us his own robe of what? Righteousness. We have no work for it. Christ decided to dignify us. 
Let's read some verses. Romans 2 often says, Be devoted to one another in what? Brotherly love. Dignify one another above yourselves. It's amazing. Because first Peter 2 9, I mean, I don't understand this. Why would God do this to us? He said, But you are a chosen people. Me, a royal priesthood. I know I'm not holy, but it's calling me a holy nation. A part of this holy nation. Is there a mistake here? No. It's because of what he has tried to make out of us. And he said, you are God's special possession. He is dignifying us. He's setting us in the, at a level that we know that we don't really belong there. But that's what he calls us anyway. We are like prodigal sons. And he said, you are my child. He dignifies us. So we, when we look at each other, let's begin to learn how to dignify each other. You know, it's a kind of honor. You, when you talk to people, you show that you, you appreciate them and you dignify them. You put them in a place of honor. Not that you're trying to just build them up and make them feel like they're the best in the whole world. But you talk to them in a way to know that there's something in them that Christ really, really appreciates. And that's why in church, we don't say one spiritual gift is a small gift. There are so many people in this church, they are silent ministers. Some of us are, you know, gifted to come to the front to preach. But it doesn't mean that my gift is more important than the gift of somebody who is able to give a beautiful smile on Sabbath morning to people and encourage them. And so we have to dignify those people. We have to, we have to honor them. We have to acknowledge their spiritual gifts. It's amazing, after worship service, when you see all these little ones putting together the inners, it touches my heart because they are doing a big service that's probably much more bigger than what some of us, the elders, that we do up front here. So, brothers and sisters, let's dignify, let's honor one another. He, you should not get wrong, is to encourage one another. You see, let me put it this way. If you don't encourage people in the church, or if you don't get encouragement in the church, why do you think you will get it outside the church? I mean, maybe your workplace is different from mine, but at my workplace, people are always whining, <laughs> telling all the stories of things that are not working, and how the old system is broken, and how everything is going the wrong way, is that the way to get encouraged? I mean, if you, if I don't get encouragement in the church, within my church family, where am I going to get the encouragement? At work? Oh, no, thank you. Because it's not there. Our co-workers, most of them are out there to tell us how bad things are and how hopeless the whole world is. So when we come here, don't let us bring more whining. <laughs> Let's encourage one another. Amen. Don't let us talk about things that are broken, but let's talk about things that Christ is fixing. Amen. It's still the same thing, but we're just saying another way. That Christ is working on us. Let's encourage one another. How do we encourage one another? Let us encourage one another. Let's pour one another up towards love and good deeds. You know, I was touched by that little boy. He wanted to pray. He wanted to do something. That's powerful. That's church. And when that, my sister was singing, she was singing her heart. Her heart. You know, it's not about the perfection of, you know, oh, don't turn your head to the left. This is a church. You understand? We, we blend. We do things. We encourage one another. First Thessalonians 5 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. Amen. Wow, that's a big one. Because we want people to grow in church, in the knowledge of Christ. Hebrews 3 13 says, But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called what? Today. 
there must be encouragement. It's a daily dosage. Okay? And that's why I'm going to challenge this church. I know we try for most of us, it's Sabbath after Sabbath, but there's nothing wrong during the way to say, how are you doing? Let's begin to work on that. Encourage one another. Very powerful. Encourage one another. Now we're going to go to the head. Fellowship with one another. We're almost done. Fellowship with one another. You know, if I say this and some of you feel offended, please forgive me. I already preached that one. It's the end of it. So I hope I'm covered. <laughs> Sabbath school does not start at 10.30. Okay. Sabbath school does not start at 10.30. If we really want to enjoy fellowship with one another, Sabbath school starts at 9.30. And that's when we can study together. I know some of us, we have some challenges, but let's begin to work on it. Set a goal. Today, I came to church, 10.45. Next Sabbath, I pray by the grace of God, I'm going to come at 10.00. Amen. Wow, big difference. And after two Sabbaths, I said, Lord, I want to make it 10.15. And then try it. And one day, you are going to be here at 9.30. I said, Lord, what did you just do in my life? I'm, I'm getting at 9.30. Because fellowshiping is very important. I know we, you know, Metro, I mean, we're great. Okay? But of time, too. We're there. We fellowship, we do a lot of great things. But the one I'm talking about here is when we have to come together to sing, to pray, to study. It's very important. That we fellowship together. Speak to one another with psalms, with hymns. That's when we sing. We're encouraging one another with the singing. It's not just open to him this and we sing and it's done. No, we're encouraging one another as we sing. And Hebrews 10 25 says, Let us not do what? Give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. It. But let us do what? Encourage one another and all the more. As the day is approaching. The day is approaching. Very soon, our Lord Jesus Christ will come. Brothers and sisters, we need to continue in fellowship. We are encouraging people to come for midweek prayer. We are encouraging people to come for Vesper services. We need to spend more time fellowshipping together. And the good news about fellowshipping together is that, let's remember that someday, we will not have the privilege of fellowship together. Physically. Someday, when the time of trouble comes, <coughs> we don't have to hide. We don't have to depend on what we've learned when we were fellowship together. And that's why last week when Pastor Anse was saying that as a church, we need to be united in prayer. We need to be united in fasting. We need to be united in doing the work of God. That's part of fellowship together. I may have a great idea of evangelism. I say, you know what? Pastor Anse, I think your idea is good, but I don't like it. So you can go ahead and do your own evangelism. I'm not going to go ahead and do my own evangelism. Is that fellowship together? No. We want to combine our ideas. Let it be the way Christ wanted and do the will of God. So let me ask you, church, what is A? Accept one another. What is B? What is C? Great. What is D? What is E? And what is F? Are we ready to do this? Are we ready to do this, Metro? Are we ready to do this? See, because God depends on us to do this, that His name may be glorified. Because when we do this, we are already doing evangelism. 
because we're doing this to one another, so it's easier for us to do it to other people. And let me repeat it again. This message is not to come to Metro and say that you don't love one another. So if there's anybody in this congregation that's thinking, is Adi trying to tell us that we don't love one another? That's not the message. The message is that we are not perfect in that love yet. Because until we be, begin to do it exactly the way Christ did it, we're still learning. And it's that learning that we're looking at. Is there something we can do better? Let's do it. Is there something we can do in a way that is more meaningful? Let's do it. And I pray that as we do this, that God himself will bless us. One of the, one of the challenges that we have as a church, let me say it, is that when you listen to a sermon like this, you go home, you may forget. So I want us to have some accountability. So kids, when you get home, ask your parents what they learn. Okay? And if you don't want to tell you, tell them, but brother, I didn't ask us to ask you. Okay? And grown-ups, please, when you get home, if you have kids, ask your kids. What did they learn about them? Message today. Brothers, sisters, ask yourself. Cousins, ask your uncle. Uncle, what did you learn from the message today? Because the more we talk about it, the more we decide what we're going to do about it. That's what makes it very practical. And as we begin to close, I want to share with us what Ellen White said. This is very important. She wrote this. She said, Many of those who profess to love the Savior neglect to love those who are united with them in Christian fellowship. We are of the same faith. We are members of one family. We are all children of the same Heavenly Father with the same blessed hope of immortality. How close and tender should be the tie that binds us together. And she went off further to say, the people of the world are watching us. We are right there, they're watching us. They are looking at us, they are wondering. They are watching us to see if our faith is exerting a sanctifying influence upon our hearts. This is evangelism. If you do what we have studied today, again, we're going to stumble. We're going to learn new things. But let's get back on track and continue accepting one another, bearing with one another, caring for one another, dignifying one another, encouraging one another, and fellowshipping with one another. Jenny, I'm going to pick on you again. Because this man, John, John was born in England in 1739. He was orphaned at the age of 12. So his whole hope of being educated was just like over. So John decided to go and learn how to be a tailor. <laughs> and he did. But after that, he decided he still wanted to get educated. So he self-educated himself because there was no money. At the age of 16, John gave his life to Christ. And later became an ordained pastor in the Baptist church. It was a very small church. And so, seven years later, he got an offer from a very big church. Wow, answered prayer. And John was going to move to this big church. But then, he realized the bond that he already had with the people in his church. John said, why should I leave this church because of more money? Or because of more fame? I'd rather stay in this small church. They don't have a lot of money, but there's the love of Christ. Amen. And so John wrote this beautiful song. SDH 350, blessed be the time that binds our hearts together. Our hearts in what? In Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is lied to that about. Because John realized that we are all one in Christ. 
and we can be bound together by that tie which is the love of Christ. If that's what you want to experience, let's stand together. Let's open our e book to King number 350. Your name be ever glorified, for we are praying in Jesus' name.